Good afternoon, everyone. This is the pre-launch news conference for Aquarius SAC-D. Aquarius SAC-D will be launched on a United Launch Alliance Delta II rocket on Thursday morning at 7.20 a.m. And here to talk now about the status of our launch preparations and a little bit about the mission itself is Eric Ianson, the Aquarius Program Executive from NASA Headquarters. Thanks, George. Omar Baez, the NASA Launch Director from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Vernon Thorpe, the NASA Program Manager for NASA Missions from the United Launch Alliance. Amit Sen, the Aquarius Project Manager from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. And Captain Sean Hanna, the launch weather officer from the 30th Weather Squadron at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And now we'll begin with Eric Ianson, our Aquarius Program Executive from NASA Headquarters. Eric. Thanks, George. Sorry for stepping over you on the first time. <laughs> in just two short days, the Aquarius SAC-D satellite will be launched into orbit, and those of us on the mission team could not be more excited. This important Earth science mission is NASA's first attempt to measure ocean surface salinity from space. Obtaining global measurements of salinity is key to our better understanding of ocean circulation, climate, and the Earth's water cycle. In just a little bit, uh, there'll be a science briefing that'll provide a lot more detail on uh, salinity and uh, the science of Aquarius. If I can go to my first graphic, please. When Aquarius SAC-D reaches orbit, it will join uh, 13 other NASA Earth Science satellites, many of which are also making oceanographic measurements of parameters such as sea surface temperature, wind, sea level, ocean color, and, o and changing ocean mass. The addition of Aquarius to this suite of instruments helps create a more complete picture of our oceans and the impact on the Earth's climate. Another important aspect of the mission is NASA's continued partnership with the Argentina Space Agency, CONI. NASA frequently collaborates with other space agencies on its missions. NASA and CONI have successfully worked together on satellite missions over the last 15 years. Uh, however, in, uh, Aquarius SAC-D represents a great leap forward uh, for the two agencies and our collaborations. For one, it is by far the most complex and challenging mission ever attempted through a partnership between the United States and Argentina, and it's as capable as any Earth science mission that NASA has flown. Second, uh, the contributions of each agency are of equivalent, of equivalent importance, uh, wherein NASA is providing uh, the primary instrument Aquarius and the launch vehicle, and CONI is providing the uh, satellite bus SAC-D and the mission operations and ground system. Now, when we think about space missions, we're often in awe of uh, the technical challenges with developing uh, instruments and spacecraft, getting them into orbit, and delivering breakthrough science. In the case of Aquarius SAC-D, the logistics of the mission were as challenging as the technical aspects due to the multiple uh, institutions involved and facilities. I'd like to take a few minutes to walk you through the unusual path that this mission took to get to the launch pad. So if I can go to my next graphic, please. The Aquarius instrument is comprised of a radiometer built at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, and a scatterometer built at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Once both major components of the instrument were completed, the radiometer was trucked across the United States from Goddard to JPL, where it was integrated with the rest of the instrument. If I can go to my next graphic. Following successful completion of, of testing of the fully integrated Aquarius instrument, it was placed in a shipping container and airlifted by the U.S. Air Force to San Carlos de Bariloche, Argentina, where, under CONI's direction, it was integrated with the SACD Observatory. Next graphic. At about the same point in time, CONI was receiving instruments and instrument components from Canada, France, and Italy as additional science payloads to be added to the observatory. A total of eight instruments, with Aquarius designated as the primary, were integrated on the observatory in Argentina. Following the, su the successful integration and uh, functional testing of the observatory in Argentina, oh, I'm sorry, next graphic. 
Uh, following the successful integration and in functional testing of the observatory in Argentina, the observatory was airlifted again with the help of a U.S. Air Force C-17 aircraft to São José dos Campos, Brazil, for environmental testing. Utilizing the Brazilian Space Agency INPAE's state-of-the-art facilities, Aquarius-SAC-D was subjected to a battery of environmental conditions to verify its readiness for what it will see during launch and on orbit. Next graphic. After all these tests were successfully completed, the observatory had a last transcontinental journey to make, this time using two C-17 U.S. Air, Air Force transports from two different Air Force bases. The observatory and associated support equipment was airlifted from Brazil to Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, where it now awaits one last transport, launch into orbit on June 9th. Back to you, George. All right. Thank you, Eric. And now to our NASA launch director, Omar Baez. Omar. Thank you, George, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending today's brief. I'm very fortunate to be here representing scores of uh, men and women from NASA and the Launch Services Program and United Launch Alliance. These folks have been dedicated to analyzing, fabricating, assembling, and checking out and testing the Delta 27320 for the Aquarius Sac D mission, which is set for this Thursday morning. If you could roll our uh, short video here, I'll talk to you about how this uh, vehicle uh, came about and uh, was erected. Um, this particular Delta II is a two-stage uh, with three solid rocket motors. This is the uh, first stage being erected onto Slick 2's uh, launch mount. Uh, this started uh, on March 1st. Towards uh, um, the end of the month, we completed uh, the erection and electrical testing of the vehicle and um, and successfully completed the cryogenic testing of the vehicle um, on its uh, crew cert uh, on May 20th. This is the second stage. It provides the, uh, the circularization of the orbit and the f final oomph. It's also uh, the brains of the outfit with the uh, flight computer being on top there. Um, that is the encapsulated uh, sec D with Aquarius on it in its uh, five sector can being erected onto the tower and being lowered onto the second stage. Um, this is what we call our uh, 10 foot composite fairing. It's a two piece uh, fairing that uh, has su successfully flown and separated 57 times. And uh, just to give you a summary of, last, of, of the week's event and last week's event, uh, last Thursday we completed our flight readiness review. That gave us the go to be able to go and load uh, uh, second stage oxidizer, which occurred on Friday. We loaded uh, fuel on the second stage uh, yesterday, Monday, uh, and finished our uh, mission dress rehearsal uh, quite successfully this morning. Uh, we completed the agency's launch readiness review, um, and that was successful. The operation tomorrow afternoon includes closing out the spacecraft payload fairing access doors, uh, loading RP-1 in the first stage, and removing the MST, which is currently uh, going to occur around uh, 10 p.m. About 3 a.m. in the morning, our management team will be on station in preparation for initiating uh, the terminal count at 4.20 in the morning. Uh, we will get a weather brief and then proceed into cryogenic load at about 5.30 in the morning. We will check our flight termination system and perform the vehicle engine slews and uh, have a 20-minute built-in hold at about T minus 15 minutes and a 10-minute uh, built-in hold um, at T minus 4 minutes, which allows us to synchronize if we run behind on any of our uh, previous activities. I will give my final clear to launch at T minus three minutes and liftoff is scheduled for 7.20 and 13 seconds tomorrow and we have a uh, five minute window. And back to you, George. All right. Thank you, Omar. And now to Vernon Thorpe. He is the United Launch Alliance NASA Program Manager. Vern. Okay. Thanks, George. <clears throat> On behalf of Michael Gass and the 3,700 men and women of United Launch Alliance, uh, I'd like to say that we're very proud to be supporting NASA 
and the launch of the Aquarius SACD Observatory. Our team has worked hard with NASA and CONI over the last few years to get to this point, and we're ready to launch this unique mission. Uh, we're honored to play a role in supporting NASA's science missions, and I'd like to thank him for this opportunity. Uh, for those of you who like statistics, I have a few here uh, associated with this launch. This will be ULA's sixth launch of the year. It will be the 149th Delta II launch, uh, and the 40th one, uh, the 40th Delta II from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, it will also be the 51st launch that ULA has performed since the Atlas and Delta programs came together under the ULA banner. And uh, this launch also kicks off a very busy six-month uh, period of activity for both ULA and NASA. It will be the first of five missions that we are going to launch between now and November of this year from both California and Florida for NASA. Uh, Aquarius will launch on a 7320-10 configuration of Delta II. That means it'll have three solid rocket boosters and a 10-foot composite fairing. Uh, the first stage is powered by a Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne RS-27A main engine, and the second stage has an Aerojet AJ-10 engine. And uh, when we launch, the Delta II vehicle will place the satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit with an altitude of about 650 kilometers, about 400 miles. I have a short video clip uh, that summarizes the launch sequence that we'll see on Thursday. If we could roll that now. Okay, we'll lift off at 7.20. Uh, 36 seconds after liftoff, we'll go supersonic. The SRBs will continue to burn for about a minute. Uh, they'll shut down in a minute and four seconds. We'll jettison them about 35 seconds later uh, once we're in a safe region. And the uh, main engine will continue to burn for uh, four minutes and 24 seconds total. At that time, the propellants will be depleted. We'll separate the first stage from the second stage and do the first of two upper stage engine firings. The first engine firing will uh, last about six minutes. Uh, during that firing, we'll jettison the payload fairing since we're out of the atmosphere. Then we'll enter a 41-minute parking orbit coast. Uh, we'll do some thermal control rolls uh, to keep all the uh, temperatures within limits. And then we'll do a second burn. That second burn will only, only last about 12 seconds. That'll put us in the final orbit that we need to be. We'll turn to the separation attitude, send the separation signals, and at uh, about 56 minutes, 42 seconds after liftoff, we'll separate from the spacecraft. And then the upper stage will continue to do some post-separation maneuvering to make sure we put ourselves into a different orbit and uh, don't recontact the spacecraft. Uh, this mission represents the culmination of years of hard work by teams at NASA, CONI, and ULA. And we anticipate that our Delta II vehicle will perform well and we hope to accurately place the spacecraft into its planned orbit to allow Aquari Aquarius to offer scientists uh, the first space-based global observations of ocean surface salinity. Uh, so once again, thanks to all of our mission partners for helping us get to this point. And George, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you, Vern. Now to Amit Sen, the Aquarius project manager from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Amit? Thank you, George. What Vern showed you is how we got the spacecraft into orbit. And from now on, I will tell you how we are at orbit and what we're going to do for the first few hours to go. And um, thereafter, I'm going to take you a little in a backward journey, back in time. Over the last three years, what we have done, speed it up in the, in the, in the, in the magic of television, will take you in about two minutes to run the whole three years. So let's go to the first graphic. We are now in space. And uh, Burns' wonderful rocket put us up at 408 miles above the Earth, going around. Well, it doesn't exactly look like this. We have the um, gold reflector that you see. That is the antenna for Aquarius. It still remains stowed or put together the way it was in launch. At about an hour after separation from the launch vehicle, the solar array gets deployed, and we starting, start to get telemetry or information back from the spacecraft to the ground stations on the ground. We are now over Africa, and the stations over Africa starts telling us the health of the satellite, the energy that's being collected over the solar panels. Very exciting time. And over the next few hours, we'll cross over many ground stations 
over NASA ground stations and Kunai ground stations to basically see what and how the spacecraft is performing. So that, in a nutshell, over the, la over the next day after orbit, that's what's going to be. Now, I will take you a little bit further. Um, just because we have a spacecraft in orbit, we do not take immediately um, salinity data. It takes about 25 days to check out how the spacecraft behaves in orbit, right? The attitude, the power, and all the thermal controls. So once we are satisfied, then comes the commissioning of the instrument. So the Aquarius instrument commissions at about 25 days after launch. A period to wait, but it's worth the wait to check it out completely. Now, now that I've given you the future, I'll take you back and do a time roll back to the past, back to 2008, and then I'll run you forward back in time again to the day we are. So let's uh, go to the next slide. The next slide basically gives you an idea how we came about putting this instrument together. You know, when you put together an experiment, you always think about a theory. And to prove the theory, you build an experiment. So we build an experiment about in the mid to late 90s at JPL. We're producing a pond, we put salt water, and detected how we could detect salinity, right, if we were to prove the theory. And we did. And the scientists then took one measure to take this equipment onto an airplane, validate it as if it would be an airborne instrument. And we proved it, it was right. Then that undaunting task came about, give the scientists now giving it to the engineers, saying, build us something that we will go to space and look at the world globally, quickly, and all around. So there comes the next piece of the puzzle. Next picture, please. On the next picture, you see a radiometer in its flight hardware, as we call it, in boxes. Many pieces of the radiometer put together at Goddard. As Eric mentioned to us, that these the radiometer was built at Goddard, and once it was assembled and tested, was moved to Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California, all the way trucking itself about 3,500 miles. So let's go to the next page. This, what you see, is a picture of a completed Aquarius instrument as it sits just days before it was going to get shipped to Argentina. As you see, the antenna or the reflector is remain stowed in a transport condition so that we can safely transport it across the, the continents, across the hemisphere to Argentina. So what I'm going to do is a time-lapse photography that takes you how we build the equipment at JPL and move it forward. Let's roll the video at this point. So the video takes us to Pasadena's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Here, as you see, the instrument is being constructed, not very quickly, but it's been a time-lapse video of months that took us to put the sequence together. Once we have, and you will recognize the features, we will place the instrument on a shipping container, as you see now, close the lid, and take it away to its transport journey through an airplane all the way to Argentina. You are now in Argentina, and that same container is now being taken apart, the instrument taken out, and carried off to the spacecraft where it's sitting in a clean room being put together. So the instrument is now on top of the spacecraft in Argentina. They work as fast as we do, too. So <laughs> we now take it back to Brazil to do environmental testing. This test will make sure that everything will work in space, in the space environment. We then brought the whole instrument and the spacecraft back to Vandenberg. That's where we sit. And we see the airplane coming in to a stop, and we move into a payload processing facility where we check out the spacecraft after its all of its journey. It's time to now move on to go into the rocket. We button it up into a canister to make a journey for about 20 miles around the coastline to Slick 2, where we're going to be launching the rocket. It's a night move, and we move it up to the gantry, and we just keep on slowly lifting it and putting it on top of the rocket. We are now ready to put it on the top of the rocket, bolting it very carefully and cleanly so that we maintain a proper environment for the spacecraft. Once the spacecraft was put on top of the rocket, we did test it again to make sure everything remains alive and healthy. Once it's done, as Vern showed you the picture of the fairing 
and Omar showed you the fairing, that's where it stands. And then let's go to the next picture. This is the fairing closed completely with a small little access hole remain open for the last check. And that's what's going to happen in the next few days. So this is where we stand today. A very, very important moment for you to get ready, we to get ready, to go up to space in two days from now. Let's go to the next picture. So I leave you now with a picture that it will look like on June 9th where we're going to be sitting on the launch pad, getting ready to deploy up into space. George? Thank you, Ahmed. We'll look now at the weather forecast for Thursday with Captain Sean Hanna from the 30th Weather Squadron. Captain Hanna? Good afternoon. June is a very stable month for the Central Coast, marked by the marine layer rolling in in the late afternoon and departing by the mid-morning. The sea breeze kicks in during the afternoon hours, providing winds 15 to 20 knots. This past week, we've seen a rather unseasonable weather pattern persist <clears throat> as a low system moved through the Vandenberg area, which is more typical of a February time frame. As this apartment system moves eastward, our normal June weather will, will be uh, restart itself once again with the rain layer and fog. I have some live graphics. Looking at satellite, high pressure is dominating the eastern part of the Pacific and the central coast. And there's a lot of low clouds along the ocean and the coastal region. Another weak system is pushing out of Canada into the northwestern part of the U.S. And that will be around our area for launch day. Can I see one of my slides? For the forecast for launch day on June 9th, that marine level will reassert itself, like I said before. And we'll be seeing ceilings from 200 to 1,200 foot with visibility of 1 to 2 miles in fog. Temperatures will be mid-40s to low 50s, with winds northwesterly 10 to 15 knots. Next slide. That gives us a probability of violation of 0%, with no weather constraints of concerns. Next slide. And if by chance we do go into a 24-hour scrub on Friday morning, the marine layer and the fog will be back in the area. We'll see the stratus persist again, 200 to 800 foot, two to four miles visibility with fog. Temperature's still the same, mid 40s to low 50s. Notice the northwesterly winds, eight to 12 knots. And an overall probability of violation of 0% again. Back to you, George. All right, thank you, Captain Hanna. Now we're ready now to take questions. We'll take some questions here, then we have some questions from a couple of our other NASA, NASA field centers. But uh, let's start over here. If we got uh, any questions here, in the front. Uh, Nora. Nora Wallace, Santa Barbara News Press. Eric, you talked a little bit, you said that this is by far the most complex and challenging mission. And we've seen the slides, seeing where the, the satellite has gone all over the world. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that in, in terms of like the number of people involved and if there are other elements that made it so complex rather than just the distance? It, a lot of it is, is uh, the number of uh, players involved. As I mentioned, um, in addition to the primary uh, relationship between the United States and Argentina and NASA and CONAI, um, you also have uh, contributions from uh, three other uh, countries, uh, Canada, um, France, and Italy, providing instruments. Um, and also the uh, environmental testing was done in Brazil. So, you know, the transport was, a, was definitely a big factor. Um, but this is a, a quite a large observatory, um, you know, 1,400 kilograms approximately, um, and uh, we have uh, eight, a total of eight instruments on it. Um, you know, that's much larger than, or much uh, more complex than anything we've ever attempted, you know, in a mission like this. Um, you know, we've got Aquarius is definitely the primary instrument; it's the largest. Um, but you've got all these other instruments, and we need to make sure that they're all working and that the observatory is going to be able to support all of those. So it's, it's been a, a challenge in, from a technical standpoint. It's been a challenge from a coordination standpoint, and it's been a challenge from a transportation standpoint. Janine Scully, Santa Maria Times and Lompoc Record. Is there any, uh, if, if you do slip, does the weather change at all? or um, I mean, not the weather, the window. Change at all, or does it remain 720 to 725? For the next attempt, it, it, it's approximately in that time period. It still stays in the morning. Yeah. Any further questions over here at the moment? 
All right, let's uh, go to uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. There's a question down there. JPL, go ahead. Uh, having observed the, the launch of the Orbin Carbon Observatory, um, which went awry, and I guess Glory did too, can you talk a little about how you ensured that this mission will succeed? Is it connected to a different uh, launch system? I, I think I'll take that. If, if I understood you right, you were referring that to our, our previous two launches on the uh, Taurus XL system, which uh, failed to separate the fairing. This is uh, obviously it is a quite it, it is a different system. This is uh, the Delta II. This is not the Taurus. Uh, there's a lot more redundancy in this vehicle than than the uh, a Taurus has. It's a different uh, price class vehicle too. Um, it has flown a heck of a lot more and as I said earlier this uh, mission has uh, with this particular fairing type has separated and placed uh, satellites in orbits 57 times before this one. Um, we have checked to make sure there's no crossovers between the hardware used uh, on this vehicle to separate the fairing um, to the uh, Taurus XL system. Uh, we don't see any intersects. Um, so uh, at, at the end of the game, this is a rocket. Um, everything has to function correctly. And it's not just the fairing we're worried about. Every every little system on the rocket has to work together and work right. So um, we we feel confident into going into this. But uh, again, it is a rocket. Burr, would you like to add any comments to that? Uh, I would second everything that Omar said, and uh, I can tell you that after. Uh, the first of those two incidents, uh, we did a, a thorough evaluation to check for any crossover concerns. And uh, we at ULA and NASA both did independent evaluations, and we both concluded that we were safe to launch. And after the first incident, we continued to launch uh, several times. I think we had another three or four uh, Delta II missions that year. Uh, when Glory uh, failed, uh, we did the same thing. We didn't just rely on the crossover analysis we did before. We went back, took a second look, a very detailed look, to see if the Delta vehicle might be susceptible to the same type of problem. And again, NASA and ULA each did independent assessments, and we again concluded that we're safe to fly. Okay, we do have another follow-up from JPL. So, JPL, go ahead with your next question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that a, diff a different cost structure. Could you talk a little about the cost of the launch? And just to one last question, um, was the decision made to fly with this launch system made after the failure of the OCO launch? Uh, no. The, the, um, the decision to fly this mission on this type of vehicle was done years ago. Um, the, the glory and uh, the glory launch was a couple of months ago and obviously you've heard here that this uh, we've been processing this vehicle for years uh, for this type of mission as far as mission cost um, I, I'm not I'm not free to talk to you about what the vehicle cost but I can tell you it was significantly more uh, than a Taurus class vehicle um, and uh, but uh, under the FOIA you're Welcome to ask that question, and we can get you uh, those numbers for you. Eric, uh, anything you want to add on this programmatically? I, yeah, the, well, I think the only other thing I would say is that the um, the driver for the use of uh, a Delta II is, is primarily the, the mass and, and volume requirements of, of the mission. Um, you know, this mission would not, have, uh, would not have flown on a Taurus XL, um, but uh, it does fit on a Delta II, and, you know, given the uh, superb history of this uh, launch vehicle. We're excited about how it's going to work. I just want to add in that uh, the decision to use a launch vehicle was about eight to nine years ago. So it has nothing to do with um, the recent launches. So it was all um, built in, the spacecraft was built in for this type of a vehicle. All right, we'll come back here and take questions. Follow up, uh, Janine. Delta has been such a workhorse for um, NASA. Are there any future to continue the program? And this would be for both Vern and Omar 
um, since there are just three Delta twos left. Okay, uh, you're right. There are three uh, Delta twos left on our NASA contract right now. We have uh, five left in inventory, and we're talking to a number of potential customers, NASA included, about the possible use of those in the future. And uh, from ULA's perspective, it's our intention to continue to serve the medium class market, which Delta II has served for years. Uh, that market does not have a whole lot of opportunities right now. Uh, so we see the five Delta IIs that we have remaining in inventory as sufficient for the near term to satisfy that market. Uh, so we're focusing on that right now, and uh, we'll keep our options open for the future as we continue to serve that market. Omar, anything to add on that? Uh, no, I, I think uh, Vern covered it. There is the, uh, the two remaining after Aquarius for, for NASA, Grail on the uh, East Coast and NPP later on this year here. Uh, we currently don't have a vehicle to be able to uh, buy the Delta II, but there is an on-ramp coming up uh, during the summer where we'll be able to, um, if our customer des desires to, to buy some Delta IIs, they'll have the opportunity to do so afterward. Any further questions? No other questions over here. All right, in that event, that will conclude. Oh, we have a question back there? Okay, very good. Hello, my name is Victoria. I'm with KCOY in Santa Maria. Um, what is the, the significance of, of being able to test the solidity of the ocean? And um, if it's going to take 25 days, what kind of information are you expecting to get after that time period? I can take that, um, Eric. As you know, this, is, this mission is about measuring how salty the ocean is from space. And it's one of the key missing parameters that we haven't studied about this world. We look at oceans, and we know they're salty. And we know that the salt is a mineral content that moves heat around the world. So by measuring the density of salt in the ocean and its movement and, and the water cycle and circulation, we'll be knowing more about how climate is linked with this circulation. So in effect, what would do is it would teach us the understanding of climate and what effects it has, such as El Nino, La Nina, any, any other new phenomena that we might be able to discover. This is an exploration mission, and that's what we intend to find out from this mission. Yes, question over here on the right. Hello, my name is Melissa Cabo um, with the News Agency of Argentina. Um, I would like to know your comments uh, about this joint experience with Argentina. If, you, if someone of you can make the comments, sure, please. I'll, I'll take the question. Um, yeah, I think it has been a uh, rewarding experience for uh, both uh, NASA and CONI. Uh, we've uh, had a great working relationship. Uh, we uh, have uh, experienced, uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a complex mission. It's taken a lot of coordination and really working closely, both agencies together. And uh, I think uh, both agencies are better off for having partnered together on this mission. Amit, do you want to comment on me further? Uh, obviously, I will. And <laughs> I have uh, intimately dealt with our South American partners, not only Argentines, but also Brazilians and our European counterparts. And I could not uh, believe another group that is so caring, so dedicated, that this group that I have been working with for the last 10 years. Uh, they do not let go things if things are left behind. They pick it up and together with us make it successful. That's what it counts, and the proof is today that we stand on a launch pad getting ready to get launched. So you have exceptionally talented people down in Argentina, and I'm proud to be part of that team. Any additional questions in the back over here? All right, that will conclude our pre-launch news conference. We're going to pause just long enough to change the participants on the dais, and then we'll be right back with the Aquarius SAC-D Mission Science Briefing. Thank you very much, and we'll be right back. <laughs>